Good morning, Eastridge Church. I am so glad that you're here with us and that we get to worship the Lord together. We're going to sing some songs and praise to the Lord. So if you're not already standing, would you stand to your feet? We're going to worship Jesus. Come on, McDonald.
Good morning, friends. Pastor Doug here. Thanks so much for joining us today. I hope that you've been encouraged by the worship today. And I hope that now you're ready to open your heart, open your mind to God's Word. I believe that He's got a powerful challenge for us today, and I'm excited about it. I hope that you are too. Would you pray with me? And let's invite God to just truly speak to us, deposit what He wants to in our hearts and lives today. God, we thank you for your word. We know that it is powerful, God. We know that uh, our lives have already been shaped by it, but we also recognize that we need to continue to be shaped. Lord, that there are things in our lives that need improvement. God, there are things that we need to be aware of and mindful of in your word. And God, our desire, our ultimate desire is to be more like you, to look more like you, to be the community, the church that you've called us to be. God, I thank you that your word gives very clear instruction on how we are to do that, what it's supposed to look like. And so today, as we jump into one of those challenges, I pray, God, that we would be open to receive the challenge. I pray, God, that, uh, Lord, that we would be willing to hear from you and apply your word to our lives. God, may it truly shape us. May it truly change us change us for the better. God, we, we want to glorify you. We want to honor you. And so today, God, would you deposit your word in our heart in a way that would bear fruit. God, that we would truly uh, be the people, be the church that you have called us and designed us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, we are in uh, our series called One Another, looking at these New Testament challenges of how God wants us to live in community. In fact, it's really a blueprint for how we're supposed to do it. And uh, we've been looking at it for the last several weeks. And last week we were looking at uh, one of three uh, of these challenges that Jesus himself gives. It was wash one another's feet. Just as I have done for you, I want you now to wash one another's feet. We, we were looking at it not as a obviously implementing a foot washing ritual within the church, but rather as a commitment to serving, a de- dedication and a devotion to serving one another, being willing to humble ourselves and even in a shocking way to get out of what the world would say is our normal place and to really humble ourselves and to serve the people around us. I want to look at another statement from Jesus today, another one another statement. In fact, it's not just a statement. It's not just a suggestion. This one is a commandment. It's in the same chapter that we were looking at last week, which is uh, it's not a coincidence. It's actually, uh, it's actually interesting how God used the foot washing uh, illustration to set up this commandment that he gives us in John chapter 13, verse 34. And uh, the commandment is this. Jesus declares, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one one another. And I'm going to stop right there. We're going to look at the verse after it as well in just a moment, but that's really the focal point. That's where we're going to be today. This new commandment that Jesus has given us to do what? To love one another. I've been talking about this throughout the weeks as we've been looking at the other one another challenges from Paul and from others in the New Testament. And I've been talking about how love, loving one another is really the glue that holds all the others together. Maybe a better way to to say it would be, this is what fuels us. This is the really the, the source, the motivation to live out all the other one another instructions that we have, how to live in community. And so this is a really important one. Uh, I think it's also really, really uh, important for us to recognize that this is a commandment, right? This is not a suggestion. This is not uh, someone exhorting us to do something that... Uh, that will be good for our lives. No, this is an actual commandment. And I don't want us to just breeze over that fact. I want us to pause and, and just begin by recognizing that as followers of Jesus, we live submitted to His Lordship. We live surrendered to Him as our King. And what that means is I don't live unto myself any longer, that there is a greater purpose, a kingdom purpose for my life. And this is not just helpful instruction. This is a commandment from my king. So I hope that you see the relevance of us taking some time to really examine this, to really consider it and to apply it to our hearts and then see it, how it plays out 
in our lives. And I think that as we do that today, that we're going to find some real clarity on what Jesus wanted us to, to know and to understand about how we are to love one another. So this commandment, again, not a suggestion, uh, not a recommendation. This commandment that we have from our king is kind of interesting because when, it, when you first read it, it, it kind of feels like a, a command to feel something. Uh, I mean, if we stop long enough to, to think and evaluate what we believe about love or how we think about love, at least me in my context and in my limited uh, language uh, in English and a little bit of Amharic, you know, when I think about love, I think about an emotion, I think about a feeling, right? But that's not what Jesus was referring to here. The word that's used is agape, and it's an unconditional love. And what that says to me is that feelings and emotions are a condition, right? The feeling can go away. You can stop feeling warm fuzzies about someone. You can, you can cease to have uh, the, the emotion that comes that often is how we define love. And that's what Jesus wants us to understand. And so when Jesus is commanding us to love one another, he's not commanding us to have warm, fuzzy feelings about each other. He's not commanding us to an emotion, uh, but rather to something far greater. What, what I came to realize is that the English dictionary says that love is uh, a deep affection, a fondness, a tenderness, an intimacy, a warmth, warm fuzzies, or uh, an endearment. It goes on. But the difference that we find as we examine the New Testament is that when we find the word love used, and especially when it's an encouragement or a commandment, uh, or, or even when it's just being played out in people's lives, what we find through the life of Jesus, through Paul and through the disciples, when, when the New Testament refers to this agape love, we almost always find it connected with action, with action. In fact, um, I, I struggled to find uh, anywhere in the New Testament where there wasn't some kind of action connected to the love or the, 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 the declaration of love. Uh, I would encourage you to go to your concordance. If you've got a Bible with a concordance, go to the back and look, look up love. Look at the New Testament scriptures because that's where we find the agape. So it'll all be the same there. When you look at love, go and read those verses. Almost always you find it connected with an action. Okay, enough about that. Um, Jesus and Paul, action. And what they were declaring, when, when Jesus declares this new commandment, what Jesus was saying, as we look at his life and examine his life, we see that Jesus was saying that love is a complete devotion, often demonstrated by action, to another person's well-being, regardless of how that person responds to it. So it's devotion, dedication, commitment to a person's well-being, even if that person doesn't receive it, you're committed, you're dedicated to loving them. And that's what Jesus is declaring. He's saying, I'm giving you a new commandment, and it is to love one another. The second thing uh, that I find interesting about this little verse here, verse 34, is that Jesus defines it not just as a commandment, but a new commandment. Well, what's new about this commandment? It's definitely not to... The, the, the idea of loving one another is not new. You can go back and find that in Leviticus in the Old Testament. You can, you can find people referring to the greatest commandments of God being to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so the idea of loving one another is certainly not what is new here. And so if that's not the part that is new, then the newness must be in the statement that Jesus makes when he says, love one another as I have loved you. And as I began to research and study and uh, look at the, the scripture and, and the context of the scripture, that's exactly what I found. What I found is that the newness is found in that little statement, as I have loved you. First of all, Jesus was saying, I have given you an example. I have come to live out this love before you so you could see it as a sample, as an example of what is supposed to be. And so Jesus is declaring here, you didn't have that before. Before you had commandments, before you had rules and regulations to make you right or to keep you uh, in, in, in the right direction, living, uh, living right. 
Jesus says, now that I have come, you don't have just a list of rules and regulations. You have me. You have opportunity to have a relationship with me as your Lord. And you look to me as Lord and as teacher, and I'm modeling for you. I'm giving you an example of how to live out this love for one another. In fact, last week we talked about the the foot washing and how Jesus, uh, he got down on his knees and he washed the disciples' feet. He took the the position of a slave or a servant and he he got out of his place, out of what the normal place would be, out of what the expectation was and he humbled himself. And I know we looked at it last week as an illustration of serving one another, but the the serving of one another is motivated by love. Jesus loved his disciples. Let me just demonstrate it, illustrate it for you. If we go back to verse 1 of chapter 13, it says, Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that, that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. Immediately following that, what does Jesus do? The whole foot washing ceremony. We we don't have time to go into it all again today, but Jesus demonstrated his love for his disciples by getting down and washing their feet. And what does he say once he's finished washing their feet? We know that in verse uh, verses 14 and 15, it says, um, it says, And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. And just a few verses later, we come to verse 34, which makes this declaration that sounds an awful lot like what Jesus declared as he finished washing their feet. He says, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. You see how these fit together? The motivation of washing the feet was the love that Jesus had for his disciples and was demonstrating through what? Through action. Jesus was giving us an example. There's a, there's a couple of other uh, ideas and concepts that I want us to grab hold of here, but I think it's uh, I think it's significant here. I want to just make a side note because as I think about our love for one another, I, I recognize that there are some things in our lives that derail our love for one another. There are things that distract us and discourage us from doing what. Christ not only called us to, but demonstrated for us. And one of the big ones that that I want to just focus in on today, I want to highlight, I want to just bring it to to the light, is in um, it, it is th- this entitlement. There are not many things that will derail God's purposes, especially with regards to loving one another, faster than entitlement. What do I mean by entitlement? It's this idea that I I deserve or I have a right to something or I'm deserving of something. And I think oftentimes it happens even in our Christian lives, in our faith journey. We we make this dedication, this commitment to surrender our lives to Jesus and we want to follow Him. and, and, And because we're following Jesus, we get this entitlement that, well, because I love God, because I'm following Jesus, everything should go right for me. And, and the moment that it doesn't, we get all bent out of shape. And what that does is it turns our attention inward rather than outward. And I, I think that what Jesus was doing here as he was demonstrating his love for others, for his disciples and for his followers was he was, he was uh, destroying entitlement. In fact, there, there's a, a passage in Philippians that I want to uh, turn to and read for you. It says this, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and following, it says, You, Paul declares to the church in Philippi and to us today, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had, right? And what was the attitude? It says, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. Privileges, that's entitlement. He, was, he, he, he had privileges, he had rights. And he gave those up. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave. 
and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, and he died a criminal's death on the cross. Jesus destroyed entitlement. You and I don't have any, anything to cling to. We don't have any rights or entitlement. When we surrender our lives to God, when we surrender to Jesus, we lay it all down. We are to have the same attitude as Christ. And listen, when you struggle to maintain your rights, then it doesn't give God any room to provide for you what He wants to provide. What I'm saying is entitlement says, I want to grab what's mine. And, and that's not a, a spirit of humility. That's not a spirit of surrender, but rather I'm going to get mine. I'm going to do it my way. And, and when we do that, we, we fail to trust that God is our provider, that God is our source, that Christ is our source. And that brings me to my next point. Jesus also, in that little statement where he says, as I have loved you, you also should love one another. As I have loved you, that's the other part that is new here. So Jesus came on the scene, gave the example that they didn't have before, just rules and regulations. Now they have an example. We have an example. And then secondly, he's making a de declaration that he is our source, that he gives us the power that we need to love one another. And you might be thinking, well, Pastor Doug, I'm not sure that I see that in the statement, as I have loved you. And if you're looking specifically at chapter 13, you would be right because chapter 13 gives us the example. But just two chapters later, Jesus, in the same context with his disciples, the same night when he was betrayed, he's teaching, he's leading his disciples. And in chapter 15, we have Jesus almost verbatim repeating himself this command that he gave in chapter 13. And in chapter 15, verse 12, it says this, Jesus declares, This is my commandment, love each other in the same way I have loved you. Right. So now we have it repeated by Jesus in the context of another uh, teaching of Jesus on the same night, same scenario. And so we look at the context of chapter 15. And if we back up just a few verses to verse 9, it says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. Another translation says, abide in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. So one of the ways that we abide, one of the ways we remain in Him is by obeying His commandments, following what He has instructed us. This, this is one of those new commandments, right? To love one another. And He says, when you do that, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commands, uh, my co Father's commandments, and remain in His love. Essentially, what Jesus is saying is, the way that I was able to come and, and live this life and to live out this love is because I have remained in my Father's love. Just as He has given me the strength and the power to live out that love, I want you to remain in my love so that you can live out that love to those around you. He's saying, God is my source and I want to be your source, but you've got to remain in me. You may still be thinking, it still feels like a bit of a stretch to, to identify this as a source. But let me help you. Let's expand uh, what we're looking at just a little bit and go up to earlier in chapter 15 and recognize that this is the context where Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches. And in verse 5... Jesus declares, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. In other words, if you're apart from me, you are powerless. You will be powerless to love one another. You'll be powerless to bear with one another, to forgive one another. In other words, the source, the power that we need to live out these one another challenges, and in this case, this one another commandment, is to remain in Jesus. He is our source. He is our strength. He provides for us what we need to live out the commandment. 
I think that's significant and important for us. Couple little uh, last notes, last thoughts before we conclude today. Number one, I love that he declares, uh, uh, he talks about fruit, right? That if we remain in him and he in us, that we will bear much fruit. We know that love is one of the fruit of the spirit. And, and we also know that if you uh, look at, at just nature and a fruit tree, if you walk out into an apple orchard, uh, or out into a vineyard, you don't hear the, the branches straining to produce the fruit. No, the fruit is a natural byproduct of being connected to the vine, connected to the tree. And, and God wants us to see here. Jesus wants us to understand that we don't have to try harder. We don't have to do better. We don't have to work more, work longer hours. We don't have to, it's not in our strength or in our effort this love for one another is a byproduct of being connected to Him. I want to just encourage you today, maybe over the last several weeks as we've been talking about, you know, these one another challenges, maybe it's become heavy. Maybe, maybe you've even tried to uh, uh, implement and apply some of them to your lives. Maybe you've been really intentional and purposeful as I've encouraged you to, to, uh, you know, to come alongside and to stir one another up or to bear with one another, maybe that's become heavy for you. And, and you're like, man, it I just get tired. I get tired of trying and I get tired of trying and failing. And he here's what I want you to hear today. Jesus is saying, you don't have to try harder or do better. As you remain in me, as you abide in me, I will produce these things. The fruit will come to your life. It will be a natural outflow of God's love flowing through Jesus and into you and I. This word abiding, uh, it means to be kept or held continually. You know, I, I think about this, the word to, to trust to depend on. And I get the image, get this imagery in your mind of the vine and the branch, right? The vine supports, holds, keeps continuously that, that branch. And, and Jesus wants to do the same for us. And I think that the way that I most quickly detach from, uh, from that place that I'm supposed to be with Jesus is when I, when I fail to trust, when I fail to depend on him. And what that looks like really practically in my life is when I start to get worry or anxious about things, when I take things into my own hands and I, I feel like I have to do this or I have to press on, I, I got to get this done or, and I'm not depending on God. Or maybe I'm, I start worrying about something with, with my finances. How am I ever going to be able to, to pay this bill or whatever it might be? And, and I start to wonder how am I going to handle the situation rather than trusting and depending on my source, who is Jesus, and saying, Jesus, I don't know how we're going to get through this, but I'm trusting in you. I, I'm abiding in you. I, I, I'm finding my hope in you. My trust is completely in you. I'm supported. I'm kept. I'm held by you. I want to encourage you to lean into that place. Jesus wants to embrace you. He is right here, ready for you to put your hope and your trust completely and wholly in Him. And as you do that, He will begin to produce the fruit that He wants to see in your life. Would you pray with me today? God, we, we thank you that you have called us to, to live out these things, but you haven't done it without giving us the power and the source and the example through your Son, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for doing it so beautifully, for walking it out, for living out your love before us. Lord, we, we get to see it in your word. And God, you, you, you've given us your son who also gives us the power and the strength and the source. I, I thank you for the reminder this morning that your word tells us, promises us that it's not by might, it's not by power or our strength, but by your spirit. God, I, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would flow through us and that the fruit that you desire to see in our lives, especially this love for one another that really drives us to, to all the other one another, to all the other community instruction that you've given us. Lord, would you, would you produce that fruit in us? Lord, help us to, to remain and to abide in you, to trust and depend on you. 
I pray today for my friends who maybe are feeling tired and weary. They've just been trying and struggling and maybe dealing with anxiety and doubt and discouragement. Lord, I pray today, Lord, that they would find what they need in you, that they would press in and lean in to you and that they would experience your power and your presence in their lives today. God, that they would find rest in you and that as they rest, as they are kept and held in you, Lord, that you would produce the fruit you desire to see in their lives. God, we give you thanks and praise for the opportunity to be a part of your great kingdom, to be a part of your great community. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you. We believe in you. Thanks for joining us today. We hope to see you soon. God bless. Have a great week.